Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Who do you trust? You know, uh, the reason I wanted to do this is because of the Hebrew word nikom. And it has, uh, I want to take it a little, it's usually translated into the English as comfort. Where do you seek comfort? All right. But the etymology of the word in the Hebrew goes deeper than this. And it shares just a little bit, if you would, the emotion of God. For the etymology of the word is to call, but it isn't you that does the calling. That is to say the mourner or the offended one, the hurt one. It is the person that wishes to comfort the hurt person or the person that is going through a trial. So that is the person that does the calling. Therefore, I think the etymology of the word is very important to us because what it means is if you know who to trust, naturally, the, there's no, it's, it's thumbs up all the way. It's your father. Man wants a king. Somebody can see God wants to be your king. God wants to be your comforter. And he does the calling. Now, the thing is, is too many people are blind as to when he touches you. So that's why I think the word nikrom is so important as it is utilized. It is your father speaking to your very heart. It is your father saying, I reach out to you. And to me, that's very important. The word actually means to uh, comfort or um, to come to a person's aid, um, to... Um, and um, it comes from a root, which we're going to use, nakam, which means it's a, whew, a sigh of, I hurt for you too, but also there's this touch of repentance involved. So I think it's important that you put that in your mind. We'll go into the Greek also in a little bit, but I want to teach from the Old Testament the emotions of your father. Who can you trust? You know... I suppose this ministry, in as much as a small church in Northwest Arkansas turned into a multi-million dollar a year broadcasting network, how often does that happen? That's a miracle. Who did it? Boy, I sure didn't. Did you? I don't think so. We all worked at it, but we know our Father did it. He'll furnish us the bricks as long as we do the labor the work. And that's it. And he reaches out. That's why we will never let anybody shake that construction organization, that is to say, doing God's work. It is solid, it is secure, and we run a tight ship. Our Father runs a tight ship. But you must know when he calls you, it's up to you whether you answer or not. I think Isaiah chapter 57, under, you know, the emotions of your father, why is it important? He's your nearest relative. And I guarantee you, when you hurt, he hurts. He loves you. He's not some force floating around in space. You're made in his image. He cries, he weeps. But I guarantee you he's all powerful and he's in control. So a wise person kind of tries to follow his plan. He wrote you a letter. You're supposed to understand it and act on it. Okay, so chapter 57, the great book of Isaiah, which we're teaching on television now. But I just, it, this, maybe this is the reason it came to mind, but the word is so important that not always do you call God. Sometimes he calls you. Well, when does he call me? When you're hurting. 
when you need him most, he come. He's there. He's for you. He loves you. Otherwise, why would he have created your soul? There's not another one like you. You've got different DNA than anyone. You've got different fingerprints. He created you because he loves you and he wanted you. And he does call to you when you hurt. But he has sets of rules that he goes by. And he expects us to follow them. Chapter 57, verse 1, the first verse reads, The righteous perisheth. Well, it would seem so, wouldn't it? And no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away. Taken away where? Under the arm of God. Th these hard times of the end times are not going to bother you. Nothing that you can't contend with. They don't even notice that God covers you. That he takes you out of it. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Doesn't affect us one iota. And I guarantee you the evil is just starting. If you can't, if this is just the infantry now, if you can't handle that, what are you going to do when the cavalry shows up? I guarantee you what's going to happen to you. You're not going to make it. Trust your father. He's in control. He can handle it. And he removes you from it. But your heart must move to him. Your mind must move to him. Because he know again, the very word itself means he knows when you hurt. There's not one prayer he does not hear. And he answers it in a way that it's best for you. Sometimes we don't like that. Well, lump it then. If, you can't, if you're not wise enough to know what God wants in you that he gives you, otherwise if he doesn't give it to you, he doesn't want you to have it. Why? You don't need it. It'll get you in trouble. So love him enough that you can follow him. Verse 2. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his righteousness. In other words, they can sleep good at night. When you're not getting a good night's sleep, you better do a little inventory. There's something wrong with you. There's something needs to be taken care of. Why? God promises it. You should be able to have a good night's rest when God takes the evil away from you. Or, hey, throw back the covers and invite it all in. You know, and see what happens to you. Well, you don't have to wonder. He's going to tell you. God will protect you. I want you to take this in a spiritual sense. For evil spirits abound. So take it in a spiritual way. Verse 3. But draw ne near hither, ye sons of the sorceresses, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. That's to say those that say, oh, it's going to be all right. Uh, it's not. Because Satan, the false Christ, is trying to rip off the virgin bride of Christ. Trying to deceive her. Sometimes you see special examples of it. What does God think about people like that? Verse 4. Against whom do you sport yourselves? Question. Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Great big speeches. It'll be all right. I can qualify it. Are you not children of transgression? Of course you are if you imbib in those sort of things. A seed of falsehood. One falsehood leads to another. God just isn't happy with that. Now let me ask you a question. In the first two verses, he said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to reach out. If righteous acts means those that at least try, especially when you know better, when you've been taught and you know better, when you at least try, God will take care of the big rocks in the road for you. Hey, if you know better and don't get ready for it, friend, the bucket's going to spill right over your head. He'll see to that. Falsehoods. Verse 5, inflaming yourselves, your passions, 
with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. That means to what? The Hebrew is very specific, to Moloch. You throw away your own kids to the fire. Verse 6, among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion, right to the bottom of the gutter. They that are, they are, they, they are thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? I mean, I mean God's just asking a simple question there. If you're a sorcist, that means a witch or something of that nature that dreams up a bunch of junk stories or an adulterer or a harlot. God said, do you think that comforts me? And there's the word comfort right there. That's, do you think, do you think that helps me as I try to lead you through this maze of life for you to act like that? I wonder if you would expect God to bless you if you were acting like that. I would hope not. You would kid no one but yourself. Verse 7. Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. That means to all comers. You know, that's grove worship. You got it? Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. But it's in the name of religion. I, you know, after all, I'd be a religionist kind of a leader. It's all right for me. Oh, is it? I don't think God thinks so. You may be called yourself Christian, but whether you act like one or not is something else. I guarantee you one thing, God knows the difference, okay? So what is this, what is this leading up to? The, false, the appearance of the false Messiah. You deal in false religions and morals, and guess where you're going to end up? Verse 8, behind the doors also and the post hast thou set up thy remembrance. I don't know. I guess behind what doors? For thou hast discovered thyself to another than me. Here comes the false Messiah, the false God. And art gone up, thou hast enlarged thy bed and made thee a covenant with them. Oh, we'll stick together. It'll be all right as long as we stick together. That's what Satan will say to you. Thou lovest their bed when thou sawest it. Do you know what the prime of remembrance is? It's, uh, it's um, the word um, zahar, which it means loves the male. It's kind of graphic, isn't it? But God has a way of communicating, does he not? Oh, it's wonderful. Check it out, friend. God's talking to you. Verse 9. And thou wentest to the king with ointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and didst debase thyself even unto hell. Thy little, little contact here and a little contact there, it won't hurt. Well, it hurts God. And you make a covenant with hell when you do. Don't mess with false religion. What are you? Who do you trust? Well, I trust God. Well, then act like it. Verse 10. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Yet saidest thou not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the life of thine hand. Therefore, thou wast not grieved. It'll be all right. Life meaning the existence by your own hand. What the Hebrew is very specific. It means you're willing to live hand to mouth. Just to get by as long as you can do your little thing. God doesn't like it. He wants you to look forward to the eternity. Well, it's wonderful we're going to have the millennium. Yeah, it sure is. 
Don't be like those at Kadesh Barneo, though. One day too late, friend. When you know better, it counts, so you better remember it. Verse 11. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? That thou hast lied and hast not remembered me. That's what God wants you to do, is remember him and remember his letter and what pleases him if you want to be blessed. Nor laid it to thy heart, your mind. Hath not I held my peace even of old? And thou fearest me not? In other words, God can be patient and he'll be patient with you. He gives you all sorts of room for repentance. And he lets you find out about life the hard way sometimes. But at least learn from your lessons. Verse 12. I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. In other words, when you stand before me, if that's the way you've acted, not the righteous that started, they're taken away from it, but the other. He said, if you think you expect me to reward you for that kind of action, you can forget it. 13. When thou criest, when you call to me, let thy companies deliver thee. You, you, companions, rather. You let your friends help you. I'm not going to. You're off my book. But the wind shall carry them all away. They're going to hell. Vanity shall take them. But he that putteth his trust, who do you trust? But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. You want to be blessed? Do his work. And don't mock God while you're doing it. God is not stupid. Verse 14. And shall say, God speaking, I shall say. Cast ye up, cast ye up. Two times for double emphasis. Prepare the way. Take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. Any leader must kick the stumbling blocks out of the road. That's called discipline. And so it is. 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. I don't know, you going to be there? whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite. That means crushed and humble spirit. That means that loves the Father beyond all. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. When you're in trouble, I know what God says and I'll be there. But you better be in trouble for righteous acts if you're going to call, if, if I'm going to call on you. Because I'm sure not going to call on you for those other reasons. It will not profit you. 16. Beware of false religions in this generation, my friend. Your father wrote you the letter. We're reading it. It's not from man. Believe it. For I will not contend forever. I'm not going to afflict forever, neither will I be always wroth. I'm not always going to be angry. For the spirit shall fail before me, and the souls which I have made. Um, there, do you know why that he won't be angry forever? Because a lot of them are going to go to hell in the lake of fire, and they won't be around to worry about. Many of them read this and say, oh boy, he's going to forget. No, he isn't. It's going to be nice when you're gone. That's what he's saying. Verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth. I was angry because he was doing that way. And smote him. I hid me and was wroth. I didn't talk to him. And he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. Just keep it up, friend. That's what God is saying. Verse 18, I have seen his ways and will heal him. You've got to add the word any time. That means any time he repents. Any time he changes. You don't change, friend. If you, you get caught up in deception and you don't change, you're in trouble. All right? I will lead him also and restore comforts. There's the word. He will do what? God will restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. 
the, I will comfort them. That means I will call to them. I will go to them. I will strengthen them. For what reasons? For false religion and for lies? No. For pretense? No. God hates it. But for doing what's right. He, now, I, I want you to really understand the Hebrew word comforts here. Well, the etymology of it. This is going to take you a little deeper than you can go in a Strong's. But the etymology of the word is he calls. He calls you. That is, he don't beg you. He doesn't beg you. He calls you. He touches you and comforts you. Now, let me tell you something. Your father wrote you this letter. Don't join some cult. Well, how, how do I know it's a cult? Well, they want you to, they want to do your thinking for you. You must think for yourself. Your father wrote this letter to you. He expects you to understand it, or are you biblically illiterate? A child can uh, read it with understanding if you listen to your father instead of traditions of men. He reaches out to touch you. Then if you find something in the Word a little difficult, let him know you're having trouble with it. Let him know you're not clear on that point. Guess what he'll do? He'll come to you. He will. Why? He loves you. You're worth it when you're doing it his way. Otherwise, that's all. Do you know why he says that? Well, listen to it. 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord. And I will heal him. What? He that repents. I told you repentance was part of that word. Get your act straightened out. I'll hear him then. Not until, friend. Why? Verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea. Their whole life is. All topsy-turvy. When it cannot rest, you're never going to have a calm day. The wicked aren't whose waters cast up mire and dirt. All they do is stir up a lot of dirt and mire and unhappiness when you deal with traditions of men, friend, rather than your father's word. He wants to comfort you. He wants to touch you. That's how he feels about it. The word documents it in the Hebrew. Otherwise, he said, the wicked just aren't going to make it. Well, what do you do with someone then that stirs up trouble and uh, get away from them? You don't have to put up with uh, trouble in life. God removes you from it, all right? You don't have to put up with that. Let other people have the bad times. You have the good times by obeying your father. Verse 21. There is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. Just isn't there. I've never seen such a tender word that our Father puts forth wanting to comfort you. And, to say, and, and does he not have the right in as much as he owns your soul? Ezekiel chapter uh, 18 verse 4. God owns all souls. You can't give him your soul. He already owns it. You're his to do with as he chooses. But he's always fair and just. So there you have that tender word where he says, I'm going to call you when you try to do what's right. And I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to help you. And when you repent, you're going to find that peace of mind. Otherwise, you're going to continue stirring up dirt in your life over and over and over. It's so easy to have a nice day in the Lord's Word, when you stay in the Lord's Word. That's our sign-off on television every day. Every day's a good day in the Lord because He is the living Word. He instructs us, and sometimes we refuse to take His instruction. What happens then? You're going to be deceived. When you get away from your Father, Almighty God, you're going to wind up in a trap. And hey, if you enjoy that, have a good trip. It's all right with me, but don't do it here. Our Father loves His children. 
that follow him. And they are removed from that kind of junk. Thank God for that. Now, let's take, you know, it would be good if man could learn that lesson about comfort and advice. They could just trust God. But what, what do they do? You know, let's, let's remember old Job for a minute, all right? Let's turn there, as a matter of fact. Let's go to Job chapter 1 for a minute here. <coughs> Job, of course, in the Hebrew tongue means persecuted. And Satan had been walking to and fro on the earth, as it says in chapter 1, um, verse... Uh, ooh, I'm in... <laughs> I'm in the wrong book. Excuse me a minute. I was going to read chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 of Job, and it didn't read right. You know why? I was in the book of Esther. <clears throat> It'll happen every time. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all be perfect? That'd be great, wouldn't it? We all fall short, but remember your father, all right? Uh, verse 7 of uh, chapter 1, the great book of Job. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it and stirring up mire and mud and causing trouble in people's lives. All I can. And he said, Well, what? And God continues on. Well, let's read the next verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and an upright man. One that feareth God and escheweth evil. I mean to tell you, Job had it. Had children, he had money, had it all going for him. Well, Satan, to make a long story short, says, Oh, God, if, if you'll move that wall down from him, I know you protect him because he asked for your protection. Do you ask for God's protection around your family? You should. Okay? And uh, Satan says, God says, Okay. Job is good enough. My boy is good enough. Sometimes he says this about you, friend. He says, my servant so-and-so can handle anything that comes along. Satan says, let me have them for a minute and I'll show you. I'll show you what I can do with them, how strong and upright they are. Well, make sure when Satan starts whispering in your ear, you know how to say, get behind me. Okay? Because Satan cleaned his plow. I mean, he had his children killed, took all of his property, lost all of his camels. He was afoot, okay? Or was he out of smokes or something? I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Job was in hard straits, all right? And, um, and I mean, here he is pitifully. He's got sores. He's out in the ashes, and he's got old potsherds. That means pieces of pottery broken. He's scraping the scabs off of his sores, he is down and out. Who do you trust? Chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 9. I mean, it's, his kids are gone. Verse 9, chapter 2. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still refrain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now, if you've got a woman like that, get rid of her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> She's not worth having, I'll tell you for sure. I mean, I don't believe he should trust her. Because I do not believe in my heart that she has his best interest at mine, in mind. Uh, but here comes his friends, all right? Verse, uh, verse uh, 10. And he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of a foolish, as a foolish woman speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Boy, he hung tight. Now, when Job's three friends, here it comes. Who do you trust? Oh, I love my friends. Well, that's great, all right? But who's your best friend? That's the question, all right? I hope it's God, all right? Because friends will get you in trouble. His friend, now, not all friends, but I mean, hey, man is not perfect. If you think they are, I'm sorry, I got some bad news for you. Sooner or later, how, if you've got, I'll, put, I'll use a monetary term against my better judgment. If you've got million, million dollar advice right here, why would you take a bunch of free junk? You know, I mean, people have advice. But look at them when they give you advice. What are they? Uh, just down here on the corner whittling and spitting. <laughs> you know, I got an answer for everything and know it all. 
Make sure who you, you know, take advice from. All right. Uh, now his uh, three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him. Uh, they felt bad about it. Now here you see in action the word, the Hebrew word. And they came every one from his own place. That's the meaning of the word, to go help and pick up the mourner. Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shushite, and Zophah, that little sparrow, the uh, Naamanite, thite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. Comfort, there you got the word. The prime of the word aforementioned, okay? It means they came to get him to repent. Now, don't, don't overlook that. Check it out in your strong. I mean, they didn't come to comfort him 100%. They came to get him to repent. Now, what does that mean? If somebody wants you to repent, have they already judged you? I think so. Because if you haven't done anything bad, then you don't have anything to repent of. All right? So there's a little more in the Hebrew in the word comfort there that you see what the friends, they were going to nail him. Let's go down there and find out Job is in such a terrible mess he had to do something that was very displeasing to God. Job hadn't done anything. Job was as innocent as a newborn babe. You know, in God's eyes, he was is the most perfect man on earth. Well, that, that's saying a lot. You know, there's a lot of good people, but there's a lot of us that never quite make that level. We all got too many rough edges or something, all right? We're just not perfect. But anyway, I, I wanted to call that to your attention. They kind of have a prefixed notion before they even hear, all right? Verse 12, and when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, I mean, he, was, he looked so bad they didn't recognize him. They lifted up their voice and wept. I mean, it was enough to drive them to tears. And they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So holy, huh? I mean, right up, right up toward heaven, praising God. We're going to get this sucker to repent. You wait and see. That's what they're saying to themselves, probably. Verse 13. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. This was the usual time for mourning is seven days, okay? So they're going to hold their peace that long. Let the boy cry it out of his system. Let him cry it out of his soul, and then we'll get down to work, and we'll find out what's wrong with him. Okay, let, let's, um, we found out there he couldn't trust his wife. And let's find out whether he could trust his friend. What I want you to know, God loved him. Trust God, all right? Th this doesn't mean you shouldn't love your family. It doesn't mean you shouldn't love your friends. But don't take cheap advice when you've got the best. That's to say the word of God. Familiarize yourself with it. Don't, don't believe this man or any other man as to what the Word of God instructs. Dig into it for yourself. You've got time. And I'm not telling you to become a religious fanatic by studying 24 hours a day. Set aside just a little time. Do everything in moderation. Uh, turn with me over to the 16th chapter here of, uh, of Job as he and his friends. You're going to have about 38 chapters of his good friends accusing him just about of everything under the sun of which he was guilty of none uh, again it fits my plan of who do you trust All right. well in this case you sure didn't want to test, uh, trust your friends chapter 16 Job speaks then Job answered and said I have heard many such things miserable comforters are ye all? I mean, what? I haven't done anything. I'm trying to figure out why God's mad at me. And all you're doing is accusing me of a bunch of stuff. And it's not making me feel very good because I'm innocent. And his friends look at his sores and everything and say, You've been a terrible sinner. Just look at you. All right? Man's got away, doesn't he? Three. Shall vain words, empty words have an end? When are you all going to shut up? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? Uh, what proof do you have? Verse 4. 
I also could speak as you do. Ratchet jaw, okay? If your soul were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. I, I, if you look like I, I can understand, I think Job is kind of saying, I can kind of understand by my looks and what's happened while you're saying the words, but why won't you listen to me? It isn't true. I haven't done those things. Verse 5, but I would strengthen you with my mouth and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. That is, I would, that word means I would listen to your pain. See, they weren't listening to his pain. And, and that's the deeper emotion. A sage is to, to like to comfort. I would comfort you in a way that I would feel your pain. It's, it's not the same word in the Hebrew, but it, it's, it's a sister word, so to speak. That's what he's telling them. I would feel you. I would reason with you. All you all are doing is accusing me. You don't feel my pain. Verse 6, though I speak my grief, I tell you about it, is not a sage tent. Though I forbear, what am I eased? You're not easing me one iota. If anything, he was feeling worse for having listened to them. Verse 7, but now he hath made me weary. Now uh, he who our father in a way hath made me weary, thou hast made desolate all my company. All my family is desolate. Well, he lost 10 kids. You know, lost everything he had. Satan has a way if you'll let him. God has set forth Job as an example to you. That you can take it. As long as you know you're innocent, don't let, Joe, don't let Satan use you to embarrass God. Okay? God is proud of you. He expects the best from us. I'm sorry we let him down sometimes. You all know that. I don't, I don't have to say it. We just, I know we hurt his feelings. And I wish we could be perfect, but we're not. But do your best. And God help the person that does it willfully, willingly, knowing God depends on you, needs you, wants to use you, and then to willingly whore after the Antichrist. There's no forgiveness for that. I'm sorry. It's called the unforgivable sin. Now turn with me, if you would, to the 38th chapter, and we'll get out of Job after that. Finally... From the time his wife told him to just lay down and die, that old girl was, she wasn't very sympathetic. And his friends have done nothing but scald him. I guess God finally got to feeling sorry for the boy. I mean, here, Job knows he hasn't done anything, and he's crying out, and he's not getting any help from these people. And finally, God appears on the scene in the 38th chapter, and he says... Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, that's the whirlwind of Ezekiel 1, 2. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Who are these friends of yours that don't know what they're talking about? They have no idea what they're talking about. Now, now I want you to stop there, hesitate a moment. What do you think God was thinking about when he said that? He said, you've got me. And here you're listening to these numbskulls. Well, he didn't say that. He, well, kind of. He said, they don't, know, they don't know nothing. They have no knowledge. He didn't say a little bit or even give them credit for half a tank. He said they have no knowledge. They don't know what's happening. What are you listening to them for, Job? Well, why would you? Again, who do you trust? Well, I hope you trust God. God is never going to let you down. He cares. Man will disappoint you at times. I, I'm sorry. I know I disappoint people at times. But hey, I'm not perfect. And maybe some of you might disappoint me at times. That's fine. Okay? We, we know our shortcomings and that's it. That's all right. We can work it out. All right? But God will never disappoint you. But you may disappoint him a lot. Okay? Because he certainly in this 
game that's consummating the end of this age when he calls out his elect and Satan takes one of you in he cries bitter tears it hurts him because he thought more he wanted to show Satan something and Satan wins it's kind of sad isn't it see that you don't do that that's why I want you to hesitate a moment God is saying from his heart you had me I wanted to comfort you. I called you and said I would. And you didn't call for me. You listened to these numbskulls. All right? Those are God's words, okay? Don't, don't say I'm being hard on them. That's, that's what he said. He said, by words without knowledge. They're, they're running on empty. Verse 3. Gird up thy loins like a man. You stand up and act like a man. Don't be whimpering and whining. Poor me, baby. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. You get up from there, gird yourself up, and you stand up like a man, and you answer me. I'm going to ask you some questions. And you know what's in God's mind. Why haven't you asked for me? I could straighten it out. I could take Satan, take names, and kick dragon here. Verse 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. And of course, when you think that God created this earth, how did he get it to stay right where it is? How did he get the moon to take the proper orbit that it has? And all the stars in their place. Fixed old Orion where it was. You go over to the 40th chapter, and we're not going to go past where we are. He talks about the first earth age then. He talks about the time the dinosaur was here in the Hebrew word behemoth in chapter 40. Draws the best picture of a dinosaur you'll ever find. And, and it's perfect. He says, where were you when those things were going down? And it is. It's kind of breathtaking in a way. If God starts asking you questions like that, finally Job would say, well, Hush my mouth, Father, forgive me, but help me, lead me, talk to me. Well, your Father talks to you through his word, all of it, okay? He has, this is the best advice you can have. You could, you, listen, for whether it's farming, you know, like here, crop rotation. People finally come, well, if you'll rotate those crops every seven years, well, Lord told you that, told them that uh, 3,000 years ago. Rotate your crops. Finally, they get around. Don't plant this by that. It'll cross over on you. If you don't believe it, the Lord said, don't plant cantaloupe besides cucumbers. I promise you from experience, you do not want to plant Cucumbers by cantaloupes because you'll get the strangest taste in cantaloupes you ever had in your life. And pickles too. Right. Uh, anyway, God has, he, he tells you. This advice has been here for years and years for people to take. And you know something? It even tells you about what happens tomorrow in the future. Always keep a level head. Do everything in moderation. And God will always bless you. Trust your father. Don't trust this man. But ain't you a preacher? Well, I'm a student of God's word. Yep, I can, I can, I'm more of a teacher than a preacher. Because I can teach this word. I should be able to after 50-something years. But the word is written to you and to me. And we're to absorb it. And in that, within that, we find happiness. So some of it, we have to do stupid things, I guess, sometimes, be that as it may, live and learn, or end up in the pit. Hey, the choice is ours, the choice we make. Well, uh, everybody's picking. No, you're just poor me, baby, and nobody's picking on you. You make the decisions. Well, I got that bad advice. Well, you should have been getting advice from God instead of somebody that didn't know what they were talking about, Okay. Be man or woman or child enough to stand up and take responsibility for your own life and be a can-do type person following our Heavenly Father. 
He laid it all out for us. He guarantees us a good trip. Oh, hey, he says we're going to have some trouble. But um, never forget what he promised and how he promised that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he said this. There's never anything going to happen to you that hasn't already happened to a bunch of other people. It's common, in other words. But he says, I will never tempt you with more than you can handle. And don't forget the last sentence of the verse. I will always give you a way out if you'll stay with him. I will always give you a way out. He has the best advice, my friend. That's why that word is so touching to me that I had to share it with you. That you know, when we're in trouble... It's real common for us to call him, but he sees it and knows it. It means he calls you. When you're mourning, he comes and touches you. If you will do it his way, he will help you. If you don't, bye-bye. And that's fair, isn't it? That's totally, completely fair. If you don't do it God's way, then Satan will be glad to have you in his camp. It's that cut and dry. Okay, um, let's go, if we made to the New Testament, just a second to conclude this. You're all familiar with 2 Thessalonians, aren't you? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you're very familiar with. Because... Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is where Paul is writing a letter back to the Thessalonians again where the first letter he wrote to them kind of shook them up because he was talking about the return of Christ. And they, they took it wrong, and many people do to this day. So Paul in this Second Thessalonians is saying real clearly, I want to talk to you about one subject, and that is our gathering back to Jesus Christ. How's it going to happen? He said, I don't want you to let my first letter to you. I don't want you to let some spirit. And I especially don't want you to let some preacher. It's, um, I'm not sure it says preacher. I think it says teacher or apostle. All right. Confuse you. Because there is no way we're going to gather back to Christ until the son of perdition stands in Jerusalem, the holy place, claiming to be Jesus or God. Now that's pretty plain, isn't it? I mean, that's straight out advice. Well, who is the son of perdition? Hey, there's only one. It's not A, B, C, multiple choice. What does the word perdition mean in the Greek? It means to perish. Well, let me see how many people have already been promised to perish. We haven't had the judgment day yet. Give me a hint. I'm, and here I'm talking down, it sounds like, and I don't mean to. Satan in Ezekiel 20, 28 verses 18 and 19 is the only person by name, I repeat, by name, that is sentenced to perish from within. All right? So it's Satan is the spurious Messiah. But then he continues on telling you, hey, if they want to get all confused and believe a lie, I'm going to let them. I'll even send, I'll allow more lies to get out to them if they won't read my letter. If they won't learn for themselves, I will, I will send the spirit of delusion whereby they believe the lie of Satan. But why I wanted to come here was to teach you, if I could, the Greek word par akalu. And it means to call or to invite, but it means the same way. That Jesus called you or invites you. Has he done that? I'm not having an altar call, okay? Let me make that clear. But I want you to grasp that word in the Greek, okay? Par ak alio. And uh, it, it spelled P A R A K A L E O, okay? And um, I want you to go in that second chapter to verse 16, after he's told you who the Antichrist is, what he's going to do, and exactly how it's going down. What did he say? Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, himself, and God, 
Even our Father, your Father, the closest relative you have, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. That grace means unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, but if we ask for it, we get it. There's none of us perfect, all right? Verse 17, this is why I wanted to bring you here, and this concludes the lecture. Comfort. There's the word. Park akalo. Comfort your hearts. And establish you in every good word and work. Why? Don't let Satan deceive you. Don't let him pull you off in the ways of the world. He's reaching out to you. And he touches you. Answer him. What, what does he want from you? You know in Hosea 6.6, 6, he says, I don't want your burnt offerings. I don't want that junk. I want your love. That's the one thing you can't force is someone to love you and have it be true love. It's a bunch of fake. Just fake. Fakery. And love grows over a long period of time. And it's hard to understand sometimes. I guess one of the hardest things to understand in the world. But don't lose your love for him. It's precious. What he's saying there, he reaches out to you when you hurt. And, and he wants you to understand and be with him. He'd like to use you. Well, how does how is it that God picks someone he can use? Someone that can set a pretty fair example and that he can trust. Otherwise, I'm sorry, he can't use you. Right. Do you blame him? I mean, you know, he's fair, totally fair. And again, I'm sure we all fall short. But he expects you to be able to at least discipline yourself in the act of loving him. That's not asking too much. And to set a decent example whereby when people see you, they say, there's a Christian. God really, you can tell by looking, God blesses that person. I, I wish I could be like they are. I wish I could be blessed like that. You see, that you're a walking advertisement to the non-believers. What kind of message, what kind of advertising are you giving? I wish I could say mine was a lot better. I'm blessed that I have been given a platform that goes in over 100 million homes and around the world. 325 television stations in this hemisphere. But God did that, and I thank him for that. But I, I want to break this back down to everyday life. Everyday life. Is you are that walking advertisement. And when people see you, they can feel your spirit. Whether it's sweet, whether it's salty. And you should be a little salty. Because salt makes a difference and you should make a little difference. But I think it's wonderful in understanding the nature of God. And any of you that want to take this back to that study of mine in uh, El Shaddai, which the nature of God it makes a wonderful study to go with this to feel his emotions. Because El Shaddai, being one of his names in Hebrew, what do you say when you say El Shaddai? You say the breast and the womb. Why? Because God is, is he who feeds you with the love that a mother does nursing a child. And he is also the womb in the earth that is the safest place in the world. Those are analogies. Don't confuse what I'm saying. All right? That is used as an analogy of how loving and how protecting our Heavenly Father is. That's how he feels toward you. So you can't help loving him when you know how much he loves you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the letter you have written us, Father. We pray you give us a better understanding, and we thank you, Father, for calling us, for being he that we can trust, Father, to know that when we're in need, you're there. 
we accept, Father, on repentance in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the Scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.